Hello, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you, sir. All right, so, uh, so kind of starting off with, so this is the Pearl Harbor right here. Uh, Pearl Harbor, we just recently changed our name to the Pearl Harbor National Memorial. Uh, starting off with, you know, as, as Dorinda was talking about how calm the morning was, you got to imagine like a you know, nice, calm morning like this, a little bit, a little bit past the 7 o'clock when everything first started, but it was a nice, peaceful day kind of like this. So let's go ahead, go on in and check out the, the first museum. So the first museum we're going to talk about is the Road to War Museum. And the Road to War Museum is essentially the events leading up to the attack on Pearl Harbor. Now, during this time, you know, Japan and the United States have, are not in conflict yet. They're not fighting anything like that yet, but they're, they are having disagreements of what's going on in the Pacific. So uh, this is just kind of a wall of some of the civilians that we do have that you can see that we have on this wall here. And then right here, you kind of talk about like um, life back in the United States, you know, approximately like in the 1930s. You kind of know about like what happened from World War One, kind of have the depression, things like that. And we're kind of working on, you know, what's next for the United States. The United States is dealing with new things going on and also learning about things happening in Europe as well. And while all of this is going on, uh, you know, the new home for the Pacific Fleet is going to be in Pearl Harbor. So they brought the new fleet, the fleet to Pearl Harbor, and this is basically where, you know, when you think of Battleship Row. Yeah, new things were being developed at this time. Uh, little things like, for example, radar. Radar has been slowly developed as a way to detect aircraft, finding aircraft, and, you know, just all kinds of new technologies being brought out. So uh, one other new technology that has been around forever is Cobra. So one of the devices that we have is, is breaking a code. So uh, little did we know, we actually knew a little bit about something happening from the Japanese. Japanese were trying to plan something. We knew that they were planning something because of the diplomatic code that we were able to break. We just didn't know quite what. Now talking about navies of the Japanese and the Americans, uh, the age of the battleship was still in play. So this is a, a model of the US Arizona. <clears throat> this shell is actually a replica of one of the shells that, that would fire out of the Arizona's cannon itself. Now, one of the new technologies that had come out around this time was the advent of the aircraft and the modernization of the aircraft. And what we have right here is we have the aircraft carrier, Akagi. And this is one of those new technologies that was brought around kind of late in World War I, but had been modernized kind of in World War II, and the Japanese had wholeheartedly developed the technologies having a, a carrier-based fleet. Now, again, we're talking about technologies being brought up. So technologies that they had to work on with uh, during the, before the attack on Pearl Harbor, Japan had to develop bombs designed to penetrate the armor of battleships while also... Um, not penetrating too much that it just goes right through the ship and explodes in the water. A couple other things they had to account for is they had to account for the shallow depth of the Pearl Harbor and that the depth of the, uh, of the waters of Pearl Harbor was so shallow that most normal torpedoes would actually run aground. So they had to create new technology so that their torpedoes couldn't adapt for it. And last but not least, you know, also in our museum, we actually talk about a little bit about the Japanese civilian life as well. You know, talking about how Japan, you know, their bold economic vision, trying to gather more resources for their homeland and trying to expand and trying to do their own things. <clears throat> And at this point, you know, relations between the U.S. and Japan have just slowly started to fall apart.
the next museum we're going to check out right now is the Attack Museum. Now, in between these two museums, you kind of have a moment to like, kind of think about, like, this is what relations were like between the U.S. and Japanese, and kind of learn about what uh, was, was, was about to happen. Now, the Attack Museum, the, the name for itself is quite self-explanatory, the attack, talking about the attack on Pearl Harbor. Now, this scene you're about to see here is kind of an, uh, indicative, indicative what, like, you know, someone like Dorinda might have seen, like, on that day on December 7th of planes just kind of flying overhead. For those, for those civilians or even military personnel that was on the shoreline, this is what they would have seen that day, you know, just planes flying overhead and, you know, all this military activity going on. Uh, one of the first point of contact that happened during this time was when the destroyer ward actually comes in contact with Japanese military submarine. That was the first point of contact of during the attack on Pearl Harbor. Excuse me. About the aircraft carriers coming across 3,000 miles of so ocean. That is correct. Now, better detection uh, was one of those own things where we had our technology, when we see, think of it as a modern day, we think of it as amazing technology that was very easy to use. Back then, when you had to figure out technology, you actually had to manually track them, plot them on a course, and mark them what time, you found, what, what time you tracked them, and you would actually have to manually plot each time you'd see a mark. It was one of those things where, yes, radar was new, but all we really knew was something was coming, not necessarily who or what. And the radar station was very, very, very large radar station. This is an example of what one of the radar stations would look like. And this is one of the artifacts that we have of an anti-aircraft uh, anti gun. And these, these artifacts that we have, which are some of the artifacts that were recovered. For example, some of these are just like radio parts, parts from a different aircraft. Uh, some of the weaponry that was also, you know, present this time at, at, during the attack. And as we go through, you know, we kind of talk about like the attack. There is a catastrophic mass of uh, loss of life at this time, and these are just some of the images that was taken during and after the attack of well. Now, the USS Shaw was one of the ships that was attacked during the second wave, and due to the way that the attack had hit the Shaw, the Shaw's magazine actually blew up and actually ripped the ship in two. So this is one of the you know, more catastrophic events during the attack on Pearl Harbor. Battleship Rose, this is like one of the ships that actually ends up rolling over. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is the USS Oklahoma. Oklahoma took torpedoes and what ended up having the ship ended up capsizing and actually rolling over. And as you can see on top, you have the men on top trying to cut into the hole of the battleship because they could hear people tapping that were still alive inside the USS Oklahoma. And obviously, one of the, the biggest, largest loss of life on a naval ship was the USS Arizona. An armored bomb had pierced the Arizona's forward deck, uh, approximately near turret number three, and had detonated the 
ammunition magazine. And what ended up happening was there was a catastrophic fire that burned for several days. And this is actually a piece of the actual Arizona itself. And I didn't, and I did not forget, I will actually show one more picture we have right here. Uh, this is actually a little bit about civilian life afterwards. And what we have right here is we actually have Dorinda's picture right here. There it is. Fuck. There it is. Yeah, so this is Dorinda and her younger brother. And it, uh, the caption is Dorinda Nicholson and her brother Ishmael with gas mask in their front yard, Crow City Peninsula, 1942. And as Dorinda was talking about, martial law did come into play. The military was in charge now. You had to follow their rules. And, you know, civilians had to deal with many different things. For example, learning to carry a gas mask for fear of uh, gas attacks, uh, learning to deal with blackouts, learning to deal with, you know, a curfew, having to be home by a certain time and things like that. And one of the last few things that we have in the museum, obviously we talked about the attack, is we talk, kind of talk about the aftermath of the attack. Some of the aftermath of the attack is we actually have things like this. We have the rallying cry for Pearl Harbor. We have things like the, the rallying cry of remember Pearl Harbor. And remember Pearl Harbor, you know, at this time you got to think was a cry of anger, a cry of revenge. And now we still use that cry, but as a cry, as remembrance, you know, remember Pearl Harbor. We don't use it as a war cry anymore, but we use it as a cry for, you know, remember, just, you know, remember Pearl Harbor, remember what happened here. Now, uh, as we continue on, a couple other things that we have is one of the things that also ended up having after this is the question, the questioning of the loyalty of Japanese Americans. And what, had led, what led to that was internment of several Japanese uh, people of Japanese uh, descent, people of Japanese blood. So a lot of them were sent to internment camps, and a lot of them ended up joining the military to prove that they were, you know, they were loyal Americans. So that came the 442nd and 100th Infantry Battalion. Uh, one other thing, you know, we also got to remember is that yes, we did go to war, but we also got to remember about reconciliation and peace. And one thing I want to talk about is an individual named Sadako. And Sadako was a young girl that actually was um, survived one of the atomic bombs, but eventually had to develop leukemia. And for her, her message of peace was, you know, she wanted to fold a thousand cranes to get better. And she wanted to actually have the message of peace, reconciliation, and just not having wars anymore. This is a little bit hard to see, but uh, we actually have one of the cranes that her brother had donated. We can see if we can try to sneak in there and get a picture of that. All right, so that little blue thing right there is actually the crane that uh, her brother had donated. And these are some of the cranes that also students have donated over the years. And last but not least, what we do have here is we do have actually have a model replica of the USS Arizona and the Arizona Memorial itself. The Arizona Memorial does not actually touch the actual Arizona, it's uh, the USS Arizona. The only thing that's actually actively touching the Arizona is the actual flag, the flag mast. And that flag mast actually connects to where the actual flag would be connected to on the battleship if the battleship was above water and hooking as well. And that is pretty much the tours of the two museums. And what we're going to do is we're going to step outside and kind of take you to where the Arizona Memorial is and trying to, trying to get you to have a decent view of that.
So this, 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 this figure right here is actually the Tree of Life. And you can actually see this on the ends of the US, uh, the Arizona Memorial itself. It was designed to be a symbol of renewed, renewed uh, to renew peace and inspire peace and hope. And with the way that um, the USS Missouri actually sits behind the Arizona Memorial, it actually looks like kind of like, you know, the, the, you have the two bookends of World War II. You have the start of the World War II for the United States with the bombing of Pearl Harbor at the Arizona. And you also have the end of it with the USS Missouri in the background with the surrender documents was signed on board. So you kind of have the bookends of World War II right here, and you kind of can see the Missouri and the Arizona Memorial in the background right there. Can you guys see that okay? Yeah. I'm just happy the internet is up and working. It's, uh, it's uh, pretty great. Yeah, so this is pretty much, you know, you know, this is a scene that, you know, I, I'm i fortunate to see in Hawaii and, you know, just, I always think of that as like, you know, this is kind of an important part of history. And just to see both the Arizona Memorial and the U.S. Missouri in the background is, you know, just something that I can never, you know, sometimes it's hard to speak with words. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so that's pretty much the end of the tour. Hopefully we can kind of get by these people, get a little bit close for you guys. But this is, this is pretty much our short tour that we have for you guys.